Chapter One of Betty Baird. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Holly Jensen. Betty Baird by Anna Hamlin Weichel. Published in 1906. Chapter One Betty Hears the Great News i have such a lovely new book oh have you betty what is it asked edith why rose reeves of bell haven replied betty with enthusiasm a boarding-school book asked edith eagerly betty's affirmative nod was triumphant oh goody let me have it when you're done with it of course edith wouldn't it be just grand if we could go to boarding-school wouldn't it agreed edith enthusiastically but i sometimes fear i'll never get to one continued betty mournfully i suppose i'll have to be like miss jane and go out sewing for a living oh you goose imagine your ever being like dear old miss jane and edith laughed hilariously at betty's lugubrious countenance what in the world are you laughing so about asked a third girl who had just approached oh ada what do you think exclaimed edith excitedly neglecting to answer the question betty has a new boarding-school book out of the sunday school library well you two are the craziest things about boarding-school i ever saw you don't ever expect to go to one do you you wouldn't know how to act if you did ada informed them mockingly i should replied betty firmly i should know exactly how to act in every circumstance i have learned all about it in four years at lakeside and good times at irvington oh you have said ada sarcastically well you'll never get there anyhow and you might as well make up your mind to that first as last with which cheering piece of advice she walked off quoth the raven nevermore croaked betty looking after her disgustedly and the two friends sitting on the wisteria covered porch of the old manse their heads close together were soon absorbed in their new find the same evening betty the daughter of dr baird the presbyterian minister of the village of weston was walking to church with her mother when her father who had been stalking gloomily a little in advance painfully engrossed with his evening sermon turned suddenly saying elizabeth come into my study after the service betty had just passed her fourteenth birthday she was small for her age a mass of tow-colored hair with a promising glint of gold in it framed the soft oval of a winsome face lighted up by dark glowing eyes her mouth in repose may have had classical shape but as she was an incessant talker this was problematic dressed in simple dimity and wearing a jaunty white sailor hat with an aggressive-looking red quill stuck in the band she was a picture which drew many pleased friendly glances she was leaning confidingly close to her mother with her slim sun-browned hands locked affectionately over her arm and was talking with her accustomed impetuosity the whimsical curves of her mouth indicating that the subject was humorous at her father's abrupt words she stopped her chattering and looked up at her mother squeezing her arm questioningly what's up now she whispered uneasily but as they were about to enter the church she received no answer except a look which told her to wait during the quiet service she felt like a culprit to her excited imagination there was an added awfulness in her father's voice and a distinct flame in his severe black eyes every word was a menace but what have i done was the insistent question in her mind she went searchingly over the day but not one transgression could she uncover unless was it possible that after all these years her father had in the morning service seen her eat those three pink peppermints which mr jones had given her ever since she could remember it had been mr jones custom to push stealthily along the seat with plump freckled hands three always three pink peppermints 
to-day he made his customary offering while they were singing how tedious and tasteless the hour and she had wondered if the solemn little man had meant to perpetrate a sly joke she considered mr jones a perfectly delightful old gentleman with his red wig stubby gray whiskers and big steel-bowed spectacles his preternaturally solemn blue eyes peering out of his sandy face itself not unlike a pink peppermint never wandered from the preacher there was something pleasantly clandestine about the whole performance well betty mused if it was not the peppermint business it may have been that laugh she had happened to look over where old mr dinkum with a blissful expression sat singing now wash me and i shall be whiter than snow as his face and hands never failed unmistakably to advertise his coal business the incongruity of it had made her hide her face in her handkerchief to conceal her laugh even this did not seem sufficient for a summons to the study at this unusual time so finding nothing to keep her buoyant spirits weighed down she said comfortably to herself a good conscience is a continual christmas and gave herself up to listening to the sermon and watching the people after the doxology however she again began to question whether it might not be the pink peppermints or mr dinkum as several of the church members insisted on walking home with her mother she had no opportunity to ask the burning question and hurried ahead impatiently determined to get to the study early and have the ordeal over she reached there some time before her father this was not the first occasion on which she had been summoned into the presence of those august theological books and stern line engravings of great and good men and she had always left them weeping to find in her mother's arms the mercy which tempers justice however to-night she was not wholly cast down for she had the sustaining consciousness that at least she had gone through the evening service without one outward deviation from the best possible church deportment it was not always thus at her age girls have eyes all around their heads and things seem planned so that nothing ridiculous escapes them and these eyes of hers had gotten her into many a scrape but to-night she sat almost composedly in the dimly lighted study and dante's stern face looked less forbiddingly at her out of his untied nightcap as she thought it was and martin luther appeared quite recklessly fat and jovial thus does a good conscience reflect itself on all the surroundings waiting made betty restless however and the familiar objects in the room soon lost their interest why doesn't father come what is it all about oh dear won't those people ever go she slid out of her chair and went to the landing at the head of the stairs to see if they were still there yes their tranquil voices floated up on the summer breeze to the impatient sleepy child they will never go she said half aloud as she went back into the study and began to look at her father's books pointing them out to herself and whispering the titles robertson's sermons history of the reformation chateaubriand's genius of christianity commentary on the holy scriptures they had never failed to interest her but to-night she followed them with indifferent eyes until she came to her father's copy of thomas a kempis at the sight of the worn cover her face grew bright and she took it down lovingly and carried it to the table curling up in the chair she was soon lost in it she had lately read the mill on the floss and it had awakened in her that instinct of emulation which is but the other side of sympathy maggie tulliver was just her own age when she had found the old monk's book which with its note of self-renouncement had marked the turning point in her life betty had felt she could never be happy again until she possessed a copy of the little old clumsy book and she had begged her father to give her one for her birthday present maggie's later and great renunciation did not interest betty for she took out of books only the things that appealed to her girlish sympathies betty had waited a quarter of an hour or more when her father entered with deliberate step she jumped out of the chair and offered it to him glad that the suspense was over at last the door opened again and to her delight her mother came in and the two sat down together on the sofa dr baird coughed as he always did before speaking 
a thin scholarly little cough he was a very good man and deeply learned but he was not intimately acquainted with childhood and betty had some fear mingled with her love for him without preliminaries he said you have just passed your fourteenth birthday elizabeth and your mother and i have had many long conversations about your future it seems best that you should be educated so that you can teach in case you are deprived of my support he paused his thin long fingers playing nervously with his gold pen holder you are aware he continued that the educational facilities of weston are meagre and that you have almost exhausted their resources so we have decided to send you to boarding school again he paused and looked down reflectively missing the radiant smile which for an unthinking instant flashed across his daughter's face but the smile was immediately followed by a cloud as the thought rushed in that this meant leaving home oh i can't go i can't leave you and mother she cried putting her head on the shoulder of her mother who gently smoothed the tangled locks you surprise me elizabeth replied her father in his steady even voice i believed you possessed of too much fortitude to give way to childish weakness your mother and i are doing this for your own best good oh i know you are cried the child remorsefully lifting her head and dabbing her eyes recklessly only i can't be brave all at once mayn't i wait another year but i do just love boarding schools her mother smiled and patted the hot little fist holding the crumpled handkerchief i am glad the idea is not wholly repugnant to you remarked her father dryly oh it is not the boarding school but i can't i can't leave mother and you and home and and sobs hyphenated the words her mother drew her closer saying softly i know my brave little daughter will not give way it will be hard for your father and me and you can help us bear it i will i will and she sat up determinedly now i think we can pursue the matter with more calmness remarked her father as one who had retreated to a safe corner until the storm should pass and then emerged into the sunshine as you know we have always purposed sending you to the pines our cousin elizabeth's school a letter from her determines us to have you go next month it is the part of wisdom to overcome our natural reluctance to separate at these words betty flew over to him and throwing her arms around him told him between excited hugs that she would be good and do exactly as he wished for you are the bestest father in the whole world she said fervently he smiled at her patting and kissing her flushed cheek now run back to your mother and get quiet for i want to say a few words to you he was less unbending and bookish than usual and much of her awe vanished in the first place daughter you are going among girls who have been reared in the lap of luxury and whose tastes and habits will greatly differ from yours i want you to preserve your own commendable simplicity nurtured as it has been by your mother wealth expressed in fine clothes and extravagant expenditures brings neither happiness nor peace oh you know father i don't care a thing about grand dresses for myself i scorn them and betty gave a superior sniff her mother glanced at her husband with a pleased look saying i am sure elizabeth will not be dissatisfied even if her belongings do not quite equal those of the other girls she never thinks about such things i am glad to hear it replied her father smiling pleasantly i want my daughter to devote her thoughts to worthier subjects preserve your independence but and he hesitated for his daughter's characteristics were not very clear to him if there is a tendency in your nature as i have sometimes thought to be too impetuous and enthusiastic you must try to overcome it or you will find it difficult to accommodate yourself to the ordered life of the school you should cultivate the habit of thinking twice before you speak i don't see how i could think twice before i speak father for the words fly out of my mouth before i know what they are to be and betty looked puzzled her parents laughed and her mother remarked 
that is a lesson you must learn gradually dearie for it does not come to you naturally as quoting does and she smiled with a reproving shake of her head why that just pops out too said betty but is the pines a real palace father she asked eagerly i'd love to live in one for a while to see how it feels oh not a palace child i am sure cousin elizabeth's school while no doubt a substantial and comfortable building will be far from that do not have your expectations raised too high my little enthusiast it's long after elizabeth's bed hour suggested her mother softly oh i'd love to sit up all night and talk about it exclaimed betty i fear there will not be much sleep for those bright eyes to-night said mrs baird yes it is time to say good-night said the father and betty kissed them both and ran to her room End of chapter one recording by holly jensen chapter two of betty baird by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter two the secret long that night betty lay sleepless she could not have told whether sorrow or joy predominated in the crowded emotions of her heart she must leave home sorrow she was going to boarding school joy her reading comprehended a wide range of subjects for one of her age but she loved poetry best of all and this love combined with an unusually retentive verbal memory filled her mind with a great variety of poetic quotations in prose she found the greatest excitement in boarding-school stories and the sunday-school librarian could not keep up with her eager demand for more boarding-school books elizabeth baird of weston in a boarding-school surely she dreamed she could hardly wait for morning when she could tell the wondrous news to edith kennaday she could see it printed in the weston gazette elizabeth maybe they will call me miss now baird daughter of the reverend dr baird has just left for boarding-school the fashionable and widely known school the pines has been selected for our young friend she would cut it out and show it to the other girls at the pines her excited little head was crowded with fancies while pictures of the pines rolled before her like those of her old kaleidoscope fragments put together out of stories and dreams making a strange medley of color and form she thought of her beloved lily bent in four years at lakeside could she emulate the lovely lily and be the favorite not for any personal charm but because she was good and unselfish and darned her roommate's stockings nursed the other girls when they were sick and was gentle and kind to the timid new ones this had a great fascination for her for she was still under the spell of maggie tulliver's example but the memory of the vexatious way darning cotton has of tangling and the endless precepts of her mother about puckering and drawing up holes lessened her enthusiasm or could she be a fascinating madcap like peggy in good times at irvington playing pranks the leader of all the midnight feasts the ingenious contriver of all the different forms of forbidden fun there too was the proud dark-haired rose reeves of belhaven school in the book she had read that very afternoon so exclusive that all vied to gain her friendship should she be like her this picture held her imagination for a moment but was dismissed peremptorily loving little thing that she was she could not even in thought bear the sense of loneliness oh no she never never could be like the proud rose she would love her schoolmates as soon as she saw them they would be eager to see her for of course new girls are always interesting and they would soon see she wasn't stuck up they would all crowd around her and she would tell them about weston and edith and would show them her father's and mother's pictures she must not forget to take something to eat cake or ginger snaps for they would sit up late talking and would get hungry 
she felt sure there never were such nice girls as those at the pines oh she must be so kind and not want everything her own way as that hateful liz clayton said she did though of course everybody knew liz said it because she was mad at her and there wasn't a grain of truth in it she would be unselfish as her mother wanted her to be she would try so hard how could she remember their names meeting so many girls at once she would have trouble though names were easy for her one would be annie another mary and oh perhaps one would have that beautiful romantic name of gwendolen would they like her old-fashioned name very likely they would soon maybe that very night have a special name for her girls at boarding school are so funny and original they never do things like other girls one thing she was sure of she would not be indifferent to her studies she would be valedictorian mingled with this high courage and fleeting ambition of the fledgling was the true yearning for the home nest and she was glad when it was light enough to get up and see her mother no sooner was breakfast finished than she threw on her white sailor hat snapping the elastic under her chin kissed her mother and skipped out of the house that wretched lump persisted in sticking in her throat whenever her eyes fell on her mother and she wanted to get away then there was the secret i am going to tell edith mother she called out as she hurried past the window adding good-naturedly won't she be mad because she isn't going what will your new preceptress say when she hears you say mad asked her mother betty made an exaggerated curtsey her hand to her heart as she suggested grieved if it please you miss baird and with a saucy swing she ran out of the yard calling back over her shoulder all the world round if man bear to have it so things which might vex him shall be found such a memory now where did she pick that up smiled her mother as she watched her beckon eagerly to a girl of her own age who was coming out of a pretty old-fashioned house opposite oh edith wait a minute she cried excitedly and dashed across i have a secret to tell you such a secret now promise me you won't tell a soul not even ada i promise replied edith earnestly her eyes as big as saucers cross your heart demanded betty solemnly honor bright you promise you'll never divulge this secret to amy or martha or jane continued betty impressively hope i'll never i feel i can trust you edith responded betty with an air of importance a new dignity had come into her voice and edith was not slow to feel the change she saw that betty was on one of her high horses during these strict masonic preliminaries the two girls had been standing in front of the kennedy home but now by a common impulse they threw their arms around each other's waists and simultaneously hopped skipped and jumped up the street edith's long black braid bobbing up and down rhythmically while betty's taffy-colored mop stood out six ways for sunday after they had skipped up and down after betty had tied anew edith's neat little red bow at the end of her queue and had fastened her own refractory shoestrings after edith had discovered that betty had missed the middle button of her dress and had rectified the oversight after they had looked carefully in every direction to see that no one was within hearing distance the time was ripe betty's dark eyes were bright with excitement and her lips crimson with the vain struggle to tell the secret with proper dignity and effect such a secret cannot be told off-hand as one may say i have received a valentine there is a difference in secrets as all girls know and edith kennedy was the last to grumble at proper ceremony she knew with what haughty eyes she as the sole sharer of the secret would look at ada and the rest of the crowd after all it just came out i am going to boarding school next month edith screamed dropped her arm from betty's waist and stared at her with wide-eyed amazement oh oh i'll never believe you never never she protested wringing her hands even betty was satisfied with the effect 
ada may jane martha and sally knew it ten minutes later end of chapter two recording by holly jensen chapter three of betty baird by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter three dear old miss jane mrs baird now had to deal with the vexatious question of betty's clothes the pines was a fashionable boarding school one ordinarily far beyond their modest income but the principal miss elizabeth payne was dr baird's cousin and to show her gratitude for all his father had done for her when she was a young orphan she had insisted on preparing her namesake for college it was a great opportunity for betty and her mother was therefore doubly anxious to see her properly equipped to take her place among her schoolmates she felt she could do this with the assistance of the good miss jane huffnagel the weston authority on clothes who as she believed kept herself conscientiously versed in all the latest new york styles without one misgiving mrs baird gave the making of her daughter's wardrobe into her deft fingers through the warm august month she too sat and sewed that betty might appear well in the great school on the hudson her lips quivered and her eyes grew dim as she thought of the years without the light of the teasing sunbeam of their home but her hands did not falter nor did the stitches drop a sigh came as she remembered the number of made-over dresses her child had worn though clothes occupied a remote place in her mind and she was ignorant that any one could receive false valuation from them the genuine charm of her elizabeth of her sweet impulsive nature occupied a far larger place in her thoughts as she was considering these things miss jane huffnagel came in and immediately began to sew miss jane was no longer young and was far from handsome but never did breast enclose a kinder heart nor mouth a sharper tongue tall angular gray and worn she was a marvel of unflagging industry when she had nothing else to do she knitted twine wash rags she knitted when visiting the sick when waiting in the store when calling on her friends even in prayer meeting many a wash rag was begun or finished before the arrival of the preacher every one in town saved bits of twine for her and the rolls bulged out the sides of her big black cloth handbag her inseparable companion in which also she carried her knitting needles there was hardly a spare room in the village that did not boast of at least one of her famous twine wash rags in her eyes to waste time would be as sinful as to throw away the good crusts of bread which she munched heroically with her few remaining teeth the one pun with which she lightened her labors was that she was crusty because she ate so many crusts how betty grew to watch for that pun it never failed to elicit a hearty laugh which greatly flattered the maiden lady miss jane collected quantities of clothes for the poor of the town while to fill barrels for the missionaries of the west was the romance of her life and with every barrel went one or more of her own twine wash rags she kept close watch of people's clothing and used to inquire where such and such a garment might be you have worn that long enough she was wont to say it is too seedy for you and it is time you was given it to me for my missionary barrel and she usually got it to-day as mrs baird brought out a long coat of betty's to ask her advice about it miss jane began you must give me that ulster for my missionary barrel lisbeth has been wearing it for three years and a half and it won't do for no high tunned school i know styles i'll take them buttons off and sew on common ones them'll do for something else i won't have those buttons taken off called out betty who was reading by the window heidi tidy snapped miss jane i won't they are beautiful buttons and the coat will be real ugly without them 
i love those buttons but i have had them for nearly four years and now i want that little missionary girl to have them don't you think she will love them too it is downright mean to take off all the pretty things when you give anything away poor people like them just as much as we do i know that little missionary girl will dance when she gets those buttons mrs baird nodded approvingly i am going to write a letter continued betty charmed with the idea and put it into one pocket and some candy into the other for a surprise miss jane was thoughtful and dark-browed it ain't right or forehanded to leave on them good buttons i never done such a thing in all my born days buttons specially handsome large ones is dressy and come in as handy it ain't right she muttered as she turned over the coat looking at the buttons thoughtfully and fingering them yearningly it's principle you know mrs baird it's principle to take off such good things when you give clothes away whoever went and left on nice big feathers or perky-looking flowers on a hat for the poor mrs baird shook her head smilingly for she agreed fully with betty but she did not wish to oppose miss jane who felt she ought not to yield the idea of thrift dear to her pennsylvania dutch conscience yet betty's plea appealed to miss jane's sense of justice and to her warm love for the unknown little missionary girl away out west principle is principle lisbeth she said after a moment's silence looking sternly at the girl who by this time had forgotten the whole discussion and was deep in her beloved book of ballads betty looked up vaguely her eyes dark and misty with far-off things and struggled to get back to the present you are terrible sot in your ways lisbeth continued miss jane but for once you was right them buttons goes to the little missionary girl this rugged virtue makes me gasp quoted betty in reply her eyes twinkling with mischief as she kissed her affectionately for at last it had dawned on her returned faculties that miss jane had yielded the point no impotence missy retorted miss jane feeling the very foundations of the habit of years giving way as she decided to leave on the buttons it's too late now to begin anything else i must go to work and knit she said to mrs baird after rolling up the ulster and putting it away she took out her knitting and the bright needles clicked cheerfully and busily soothing her ruffled spirits presently she said mrs baird a stimulated vest is the thing for that black silk dress of yourn that we're makin over for lisbeth so dressy a uh, a oh, what kind of vest is that asked mrs baird in surprise a stimulated one a imitation one miss jane replied impatiently oh yes said mrs baird as she found it convenient to leave the room style's the thing something dressy continued miss jane when mrs baird resumed her seat as betty had left the room to take a walk with edith they fell to talking about her you have known elizabeth since she was a baby and has it not struck you that she is somewhat different from the other girls of her age asked mrs baird different miss jane snorted she's as different from them as one of them eagles that mounts to the sky the reverend is so fond of is from my little yaller hen she's a eagle is lizbeth she mounts what girl knows the poetry she does and them quotations she's always spoutin she has a remarkable memory but i hear that is common to childhood common <laughs> it's stylish nothing plain or every day she beats that elocutioner that was here by and by betty appeared gay and hungry from her short tramp after autumn flowers her hands full of the glories of goldenrod and asters he moileth and moileth all the long year how can he be merry and make good cheer she sang out at the top of her sweet young voice as she clattered into the house oh i'm so tired where shall i put these she found an old blue pitcher into which she put the flowers and placed them on the mahogany table which stood against the wall their rich beauty glorified the commonplace room betty stood back to see the effect 
oh aren't they beautiful she exclaimed clasping her hands over her breast and drawing a deep breath they looked so brave and upright out there with everything dying around them it seemed as though they tried to be bright just to comfort us because it will soon be winter and no green things about my what a fanciful child exclaimed miss jane rocking and knitting excitedly and glancing proudly at mrs baird with an i told you so look and muttering so that betty could not hear she mounts a eagle what's that miss jane betty asked for she was very fond of her and could not bear to miss any of her funny sayings a layover for meddlers snapped miss jane shrewishly biting off a bit of twine with her two projecting front teeth she would not spoil betty oh no she had strong and positive theories about rearing children her chief theory was that they should be seen and not heard and she usually lived up to it by asking betty to recite one of her longest pieces let's hear you speak your sir gellahed speech was the request this time after giving miss jane a hug and calling her a dear hateful cross crusty old thing betty recited until miss jane's needles were quiet and she furtively wiped her eyes with the half-finished wash rag when betty was through she turned to mrs baird and said in a softened voice the child must have one of them knitted bead chains like milly haines's and i'll begin it to-night betty clapped her hands ecstatically oh miss jane you can't mean it it's too good to be true i've wanted one for ever so long and i could die happy if i could have one of those splendid aristocratic bead chains die fiddlesticks retorted miss jane always restive under any evidence of gratitude and mrs baird after thanking her said she hoped cousin elizabeth would be more successful in toning down her daughter's language than she had been i don't seem to please this select company so i'll get me hence said betty as she went out into the kitchen to see how supper was progressing but she looked back to quote in sepulchral voice tis barbarous to insult a fallen foe a few weeks later when the dresses were finished mrs baird said to her husband i was a little anxious about elizabeth's wardrobe for i have heard that city children have as new and elegant things as their parents but now i am relieved miss jane has outdone herself the child has a charming outfit and she sighed contentedly i rejoice that elizabeth is well equipped dr baird replied though i am sure cousin elizabeth would not countenance any extravagance my mother always made over her dresses for her and father suits for me and without doubt we shall find the reports of the grandeur of the pines greatly exaggerated how cousin elizabeth will love the child said the mother end of chapter three recording by holly jensen chapter four of betty baird by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter four at last the day the eagerly awaited tenth of september the day on which betty was to start for the pines saw her up bright and early her trunk had been packed the night before by her mother who hid many tears in tenderly prolonging the smoothing of the wrinkleless dresses in its depths into her brand new satchel betty put her toilet articles and some delicious chocolate candies which edith had made for her thinking with a thrill that she would save them for her new schoolmates for are not boarding-school girls always half starved at the last moment miss jane brought the promised bead chain and a dazzling affair it was it created some painful doubts in mrs baird's mind but betty was as happy over it as if it were made of turquoise and diamonds miss jane's delight in the child's pride over her new possession somewhat assuaged the loneliness she was feeling over her pet's departure the bead chain betty decided was not to be worn on the journey she would save it for some special occasion like a reception and wouldn't the girls open their eyes 
there was not one in weston as beautiful and stylish and she doubted if even the pines could produce its equal miss jane was doubly pleased for she believed in saving things not in using one's best for everyday purposes not to have sunday clothes was a sign of shiftlessness the lump in betty's throat grew larger as train time drew near you mustn't go to the station mother she said for i couldn't get into the cars and leave you if you are here i'll make believe i'm only going to see father off as i did when he went to the general assembly to hide her own feelings her mother kept up a steady conversation miss jane made a characteristic remark last night she said as they all tried to eat their breakfast oh what was it asked betty glad the silence was not broken by her sobs as she had expected it would be in another minute when she was leaving resumed mrs baird she lingered in the hall the light bringing out all the kind little wrinkles and revealing the sympathy of her dear old heart as she said to me don't you worry though of course it's awful hard to have elizabeth go away i know all about these parting sceneries very good very good dr baird murmured while betty laughed until the tears came tears that were close to the surface scarcely had they finished breakfast when edith sarah may jane martha and ada came to walk to the station with her they were sadly self-conscious for they stood in great awe of the minister and betty had suddenly grown to be a personage her mother took her aside for the last few minutes and when she left the room betty said i'll remember i'll never forget sobs breaking through the brave words you make believe too mother oh i'll have to make believe so hard she hurried down the steps and the little procession went down the street edith as the best friend had the post of honor next to betty the other girls walking sedately ahead miss jane stood at her door for a last glance waving a half-finished wash rag and betty threw kisses until they turned a corner elder huggentugler whom she loved next to miss jane trotted across the street to say good-bye and to tell her to be a good girl and get all the book larnin to be had the while pressing into her hand his favorite gift a poke of peanuts each girl had a last message a last fervent request for a letter with minute details about everything at the pines even out of the car window betty had to scream promises yes i'll write soon i won't forget to tell you about all the girls write at once edith and tell me about mother and go in to see her every day be sure to have your pictures taken in a group the cars gave a jerk another and betty was on her way to boarding school while her father read the morning's news she leaned back with her eyes closed dreaming of the pines the teachers did not greatly engage her imagination it was those fascinating schoolgirls of whom she had read she would be friends with them at once those dear wonderful girls the very first evening they would come to her room and talk and talk perhaps there would be a midnight feast and they would invite her she would show them her books and her bead chain if one of them wanted to borrow the chain she would not be mean and refuse maybe she would show them the lilac dress that is if they had nice ones of their own for she would not flaunt her pretty dress before any girl with poor clothes but might it not be more thrilling to conceal it until some reception and make a surprise out of it betty loved surprises and decided to keep the wonderful new silk a secret dr baird's amazement on seeing the great vine-covered stone building a fine example of georgian architecture with characteristic ionic columns and massive arched doorways surrounded by a park with magnificent trees from which it took its name was scarcely short of stupefaction betty had all the assurance of a girl who had learned by heart four years at lakeside patty at hillsdale good times at irvington and rose reeves of belhaven school 
she rejoiced that her surroundings were even superior to those of the golden-haired lily bent who attended the most exclusive school in chicago she must write to edith and tell her she grieved to think that their ideal had been so low she and her father did not talk much as they waited she was looking about her eagerly while her father not sustained by an acquaintance with her books was in a state of astonishment don't you think this must be like the queen of england's parlor father asked betty and she drew a deep breath her father looked around questioningly to his simple eyes there seemed something reprehensible in such size and elegance and his ministerial mind irresistibly questioned how many missionaries could be sent to heathen lands by the superfluous luxury betty did not wait for an answer how large is it father so i can tell edith it is about forty by fifty feet i should say answered her father glad to deal with something definite oh edith can't tell by that protested his daughter can i say it is as large as our church auditorium well hardly child it is about the size of our sunday school room though oh what will she say said betty triumphantly are these gothic ceilings no but they are remarkably fine oh look at that chair it is like one we have with the claw and ball feet that was your grandmother's chair he replied and she gave it to cousin elizabeth is this a palace oh what grand rugs why there isn't a carpet anywhere i am going to ask mother to have rugs it looks so nice and clean and you can slide on them she exclaimed and she almost measured her length on the polished floor as she walked towards the door to peep into the halls beyond come back elizabeth her father whispered that is bad manners a tall stately silver-haired woman with a gracious smile of welcome came into the room though entering without haste she showed hospitable eagerness as she approached the cousin whom she had not seen for many years she greeted him affectionately saying in a well-modulated voice dear dear cousin tom i am delighted to see you and giving him both her hands she turned him to the light the same dear cousin tom and this is my namesake she continued taking the child's blushing face in her hands and kissing her warmly i am glad to have you here dear you must feel perfectly at home this must be your home as your grandmother's was mine for so many long good years betty felt more awed than she ever had before and could not find a word to answer so must queens talk and act she thought yet she was disappointed where were the elegant black satin dress with its flounces of lace and the pearl necklace and the diamond earrings she had never in her imagination pictured her preceptress without these essentials and no gold bracelets either a preceptress in the robes of a queen as shown in her books of history was really what she expected but since cousin elizabeth was a queen in ordinary clothes she was forced to acknowledge that the soft gray gown with its satisfying train just suited her an hour's conversation between the cousins followed while betty roamed around and inspected the pictures and furnishings of the room a church wedding necessitated dr bear's immediate return to weston so after seeing the building and especially the room which betty was to occupy and taking notes so that he could give a detailed description to his wife he said i must now bid you farewell cousin elizabeth and to your competent care entrust my daughter who will i believe prove not lacking in obedience to you with a few parting admonitions and a final kiss he took his departure leaving betty alone in her room a thoroughly homesick girl as it was during school hours this part of the house was as still as an empty church and never in all her fourteen years had betty felt so utterly alone the silent rooms around her the greater ones downstairs filled with strange people and the outlook from her windows beautiful beyond words yet unfamiliar and sad accented her loneliness 
the tears fell on her hands clasped on the window-sill and there seemed to be nothing to make up for the little manse next to the old red brick church nestling among the great maples at last she began to unpack so she could dress for dinner the trunk had been filled to overflowing with the things which she believed made up an unparalleled wardrobe the new really new fine checked violet and white china silk acknowledged by all who had seen it to be miss jane's masterpiece had been very very carefully packed in tissue paper its skirt was without ornamentation and remarkably voluminous for miss jane was really several years ahead of the fashions in putting yards of unnecessary material in the skirt and sleeves best put in a good bit of stuff for then it will be easier to make over she had said the waist too was perfectly plain save a sailor collar and cuffs to match made out of some fine lace belonging to her mother the color was so becoming that miss jane had forgotten her theories about children and cried out with delight how laylock becomes her and how it suits her figure turning her round and round admiringly though there was no more to be seen of the childish figure than there is of a lily stem surrounded by its green enfolding leaves one of her two school dresses was a pretty shepherd's plaid trimmed around the bottom with three rows of narrow black velvet and with a yoke trimmed in the same way she had a coat of the same material for fall wear the other school dress was the made-over black silk a trifle shiny with miss jane's stimulated vest of white and black silk which was conceded by every one to be a flattering witness to her taste and originality this dress betty decided to put on for her first dinner at the pines she looked longingly at the lilac but that she knew she must not wear except on some great occasion and this being silk seemed a fitting dress for her first appearance its skirt was at least two inches longer than girls of her age were then wearing and miss jane had given as her reason for this extravagance that she would sprout up like a bad weed and then it wouldn't be too long her two hats were of good sailor shape a becoming style which she had particularly liked because there was so little for her antics to displace the last winter's coat with new collars and cuffs of velvet would they had decided deceive even city eyes into believing in its newness her muff was one her mother had for many years and the mink was quite yellow almost the color of betty's hair but she felt much secret pride in it miss jane supplied her with mittens and she had her first pair of kid gloves her shoes were sensible all these with a few of her summer clothes betty unpacked remembering that only last night her mother had put them in so carefully it seemed a year ago she hugged her dearest books as she put them in place her bible that her mother had given her four years before her ossian poems her thomas a kempis and her old ballad book lily bent in four years at lakeside was like a roommate she would understand how a girl feels on her first day away from home then came a worn copy of a collection of favorite poems and a quaint book which had belonged to her grandmother when a girl in which it was written in small elegant writing presented to miss elizabeth b seabury by her affectionate brother robert e seabury june twelfth eighteen twenty looking down at her from their new abode a handsome set of dark hanging shelves which formed an excellent frame for their rich reds blues and golds these books gave her a home feeling and comforted her her eyes turned toward them constantly as she dressed for dinner and more than once she darted over to them and kissed them hungrily how understanding they looked how glad she was that she had them her father had often spoken about books as friends but she never knew how dear the very covers could be and how their gold lettering could look out with true home eyes she fingered caressingly the ivory comb brush and mirror which cousin elizabeth had sent to her last christmas 
they looked very nice on the mahogany dressing-table but somehow they failed to stir her enthusiasm with them she placed edith's parting gift a pincushion in the shape of a heart a narrow little plait of light brown hair tied with white glazed ribbon an affecting gift from ada was laid carefully in her bible a painted pin tray martha's votive offering and the work of her oldest sister adorned very elegantly and daintily betty thought the white covered table she pushed all the pins well to one side so that the wild roses could be seen on her small writing-table she put her pearl-handled penholder and a little gold pencil once her grandfather's a box of fine note-paper and a curious japanese stamp-box the room contained two brass beds so she was to have a roommate oh if she were only here now betty had never before had such a queer feeling in her heart she didn't dare to look at her father's and mother's pictures would the dinner bell never ring hoping for escape from her homesickness she turned to the window and her beauty-loving eyes were held captive by the view as far as vision could carry there were venerable trees while off in the distance gleamed the hudson like a great silver belt winding through the green waving shadows the dinner bell rang at length its cheerful peal bringing back to her with renewed force the long cherished dreams of boarding-school life its enchanting gaiety its delightful hubbub of girls voices and above all its true loyal friendships there in the dining-room were her new friends hopefully she ran down to them end of chapter four Recording by Holly Jensen Chapter 5 of Betty Baird by Anna Hamlin Weichel This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen Chapter 5 Her Unexpected Welcome At the entrance of the dining room, Betty halted, spellbound the great size and beauty of the room which in her eyes accustomed only to the soft light of oil seemed magically illuminated by the artistic clusters of electric lights the dark wood panelling reaching nearly to the ceiling the rich heavy mahogany furniture the great fireplace with high dignified mantelpiece the prevalent brilliancy of silver and cut glass and polished brass against the dark background all these dazzled and bewildered her forgetful of miss payne's instructions to ask for miss green's table she stood there in the middle of the high broad doorway a slight old-fashioned figure that seemed to have strayed out of an old picture her hands clenched behind her her face framed by the mop of tumbled yellow hair white and quivering and her great luminous eyes looking around helplessly and appealingly immovable she stood there until one of the teachers saw her and sent a servant to show her to her place then alone she walked the length of the room at her table she found seven girls and a teacher whom she supposed to be miss green fourteen curious eyes saw the new girl take her place with eagerness and evident delight they saw a girl of fourteen small for her age dressed in a black silk dress with a simulated vest that gave her the appearance of a child masquerading in her mother's clothes her bright sensitive face was flushed her dark eyes glowing with suppressed excitement her delicate nostrils quivering on her left sat a faultlessly dressed girl of her own age with a cold pink and white complexion clear blue eyes light brown hair a clean high-bred face without a trace of good feeling betty had always made conversation being the leader of the home set so to facilitate acquaintance she turned to the girl on her left and asked brightly how many pupils are there here the girl turned and gave her a cold distant stare eighty she said after a pause in an utterly colorless and impersonal manner why should the new girl address her it evidently meant betty felt the attitude though she could not understand it 
it was her first snub some girls cannot talk and they have that stiff way edith is not much of a conversationalist she commented to herself she turned to a calm pale-faced girl on her right and noticed that she too had a cold distant look and she did not feel encouraged to go on what nice hair all the girls had they all did it up the same way with a big puff over the forehead she thought of her own unruly mop and wished hers looked like theirs her natural manner won the admiration of miss green and betty after several helpless looks around the table and frightened away by that look which they all seemed to have turned to her did you have a pleasant journey miss green asked oh yes a delightful one she answered with ready enthusiasm though in a voice which she hardly recognized as her own i should have thought you would have found it quite warm travelling in the heat of the day suggested miss green i did not mind the travelling but i did find it warm work to unpack she replied that is very wearing agreed miss green during this brief dialogue the other girl stared so unabashedly at betty that miss green seeing her blushes stopped out of sympathy when dinner was finished betty hurried to her room to hide her fast flowing tears and throwing herself on the bed cried as if her poor little loving heart would break how can girls be so stiff and cold and hard she said half aloud in grieved surprise the weston girls were never that way perhaps that is the trouble i am a stranger and do not understand their ways and they are waiting to see what i am like it may not have been dislike that made them stare at me in such an unfriendly manner maybe they only want to know more about me before they become friendly i believe that is it to-morrow they will be different they will see that i am not stupid or mean and they will soon be friendly she sat up and began to prepare for bed in a more hopeful frame of mind that night she slept the sleep of exhaustion and did not wake until the rising bell rang the next morning she put on her black and white shepherd's plaid dress which by a happy chance suited her and was the right length she ate her breakfast in silence making no attempt to open a conversation though hoping that some of the girls would prove friendly and talk with her the teacher had introduced the girl on her left whose direct cold stare made her warm all over as caroline wren the pale-faced one on her right as helen dyke just beyond her was miriam kendall miriam was small with a red-lipped mouth that pouted continually while her slightly tilted nose and the dark arched brows gave some piquancy to an otherwise commonplace face she did not possess that look to the same degree so betty turned to her rather hopefully all the girls had high assured voices miriam was older than betty and tossed her hair with the back of her hand and pulled down her belt quite like a young lady caroline and helen as if determined to impress on betty that she was an intruder carried on a conversation without the slightest recognition of her presence between them never was there more perfect ignoring of a disagreeable object and only the heat of her reddening face kept betty from feeling as transparent as a ghost do you know your virgil asked caroline as they waited for some of the girls to finish their breakfast not a line responded helen indifferently miss green seeing their impertinence addressed betty pleasantly have you studied latin miss baird betty gave her a grateful glance as she replied with something of the old proud spirit the spirit of the girl who has always been at the head of things yes miss green i studied with my father i have read through four books of virgil every girl at the table turned cool unbelieving eyes at her then each with her neighbor they began to discuss her statement in an undertone and with occasional glances which plainly indicated complete disbelief in the truth of it she says she has read four books of virgil said caroline as if announcing a peculiarity of a new species i don't believe it answered miriam in an undertone as the signal was given to leave the table betty had only time to say emphatically you must take that back 
miriam pushed by scornfully evidently they don't teach manners here continued betty indignantly while miriam with her arm linked in caroline's swept on saying so that betty could hear her she's a firebrand you can tell where she came from by those outlandish dresses of hers caroline tittered yes and that hair looks as if it had never been combed how red she grew when she flared up at me said miriam fair people can't afford to redden so and her own dark face was very complacent who is she inquired caroline oh a poor presbyterian preacher's daughter a sort of charity pupil i think what a pity we must have her at our table where every one is so nice regretted caroline dorothy king won't like it said helen dyke who walked ahead she certainly won't replied miriam sharply she can't bear country gawks betty who was compelled to walk close to them in the regular march from the room heard every word of this conversation it not only enlightened her as to the meaning of that look but it was so utterly unexpected that she did not once think of replying tears ran down her hot cheeks as she sat by her window so far as she could tell all the girls were alike and all hated her she could not comfort herself with the thought that every bright girl at school has a jealous enemy for these disliked her because she was not their kind she was an intruder and had invaded their table she had herself enough schoolgirl clannishness to know what that means for she had more than once made eyes secretly at edith when some undesirable girl tried to share their walk home from school she had been too unhappy to eat much breakfast and now feeling hungry she thought of the chocolates edith had given her tears flowed faster as she remembered how she had put them away for her new friends and she could hardly bite them for sobs the poor lonely child sat there for a long time weeping and munching her candy suddenly she sat upright one thing must be attended to at once that kendall girl must take back her insulting words how could she make her do it though when she would not even look at her her favorite reading of the old fighting days suggested a way she could send her a challenge she wiped her eyes hurried to her writing desk and quickly wrote in her large upright hand miss baird feels grievously insulted by miss kendall's spiteful observations on the reading of virgil at the breakfast table and demands redress in the form of an apology before the same company if refused she hereby challenges said miriam kendall to a competitive reading of virgil this made her feel much brighter barely had she finished when she received a message from miss payne to come to her room End of chapter 5 Recording by Holly Jensen Chapter 6 of Betty Baird by Anna Hamlin Weichel This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen Chapter 6 The Challenge in response to miss payne's request betty knocked at her door and a preoccupied voice said in answer come in in a beautiful sunny room lined with books and pictures at a large mahogany writing-desk strewn with papers sat her cousin who looked up absently as betty walked towards her oh you little elizabeth i am glad you have come i was so busy i had almost forgotten you don't tell your father she added laughing father wouldn't believe anything against you cousin elizabeth the girl replied warmly remembering the reverence with which her name was always spoken at home something of this faith was communicated to miss payne and gave a twinge to her guilty conscience and determined her for the present at least to give betty her undivided attention miss payne was a very busy woman who not only conducted a large school but also wrote and lectured and attended to numerous club duties your father has told me about your studies you are i judge ready for the class in which miriam and caroline are all girls a year or two older than you 
i am not surprised to find you so far advanced in latin knowing your father's love for it let me hear you read she gave betty a fat little volume of virgil remarkable she exclaimed when betty had finished and betty started with pleasure and surprise you could go a class or two higher in latin how like cousin tom yes but cousin elizabeth i don't know a thing about geometry and i don't understand algebra and i hate arithmetic said betty miss payne smiled sympathetically of course you do we all do arithmetic is one of the necessaries of life and we naturally prefer the luxuries during this interview betty was undergoing an examination of which she was wholly unconscious miss payne was a student of girl nature so while betty read aloud a little poem her cousin was observing her minutely dear little old-fashioned thing i didn't know that style had survived she mused i wonder how she will affiliate with my fashionable set she is probably the brightest girl in school but that fact won't endear her to the others i must tell miss green to watch and not allow the girls to be overbearing but i'll not protect her she has spirit courage self-confidence a nimble wit alertness and evidently large imaginative faculties it will be interesting to watch her development there is nothing to criticize in her manner except perhaps a too great enthusiasm a contrast to my cool self-possessed pupils she reads like a scholar that's tom she stands and sits like a lady that's her mother there is however something boyish about her which will get her into scrapes she has beautiful cameo-like features though at first one does not notice them because one is conscious only of her great beautiful eyes and mass of pale wild hair what a mop i must try to smooth it out such a strong chin for a child like her grandmother's it is strange to see that chin again on a child i'll not coddle her no doubt miss payne thought she could coddle how do you like your schoolmates she inquired aroused from her study of the girl by the completion of the poem betty hesitated and looked down uneasily for she could not tell the incident at the breakfast-table without feeling like a tell-tale and only that incident could explain the strength of her dislike for her companions miss payne saw the disturbance in her face and surmised that betty had already had trouble of some kind i haven't talked with them much cousin elizabeth she said evasively playing with the book of poems of course not but i thought you might have a few impressions impressions in plenty exclaimed betty with a warmth not flattering to the girls my child i want to help you to accommodate yourself to your new surroundings said miss payne mechanically arranging the papers on her desk for she was disturbed by the evident fact that her namesake had not been graciously received you have always lived in a village she continued where every one knew you and where you have had things very much your own way the girls here have had a different kind of life they are more mature in many respects and less in others you will find them very self-possessed and inclined to be critical oh yes i have discovered that answered betty as she drew herself up now don't be sensitive elizabeth for nothing in the world will make you so miserable don't yield to it for a moment flee from it forget yourself by thinking of others as far as possible take these girls as they are don't analyze them don't think much about how they treat you you will find your friends by and by miss payne laughed and shook her head oh if you young people could or would profit by the experience of others the luncheon bell saved betty the necessity of replying but she thought take that kendall girl as she is well i guess not and she ran upstairs to get the challenge as she took her seat at the table she put the challenge at miriam's plate and miriam coming in later picked it up curiously and turned it over wondering what it was and who had sent it i don't know the writing she said to caroline oh open it miriam exclaimed caroline petulantly you always make such a fuss 
miriam did open it and as her eyes caught the words she grew scarlet and concentrated scorn settled on her darkening face the impudent thing she muttered darting a withering glance at betty who as far as her trembling fingers and fluttering heart would allow was eating apparently deaf and blind to the storm gathering around her it was not an easy situation for every girl at the table she well knew would side with miriam and even at that natural age for eagerly sought martyrdom betty's lot that hour was one to make even a stout heart quake miss green perceived trouble and requested miriam to put away the letter which she was beginning to show to her neighbors sullenly she put it into its envelope and miss green suspecting that betty was the storm centre tried to draw attention from her by brisk questions for by that time every girl at the table had had it communicated to her in some such mysterious way as that which warns insects of the approaching of an enemy that the new girl had done something atrocious for which she deserved and would certainly receive swift punishment at their hands after this zestful luncheon miriam caroline helen and several others of the table set hurried to miriam's room for a council of war what is the matter miriam what has the new girl done inquired mary livingstone at the table you turned all the colors of the spectrum though your countenance was not a rainbow of promise you were a perfect thundercloud she was allowed to get through this sentence for mary livingstone was well she was mary livingstone not only a senior and one of the best scholars in the school but one of the livingstones just wait until you read this thing almost screamed miriam as she thrust the challenge into mary's hand mary read aloud with peculiar intensity miss baird ah so that is the paderewski girl's name go on go on the eager bevy cried in chorus miss baird feels grievously insulted by miss kendall's spiteful observations on the reading of virgil so that is the way the wind blows at the breakfast table and demands redress redress good word her effrontery muttered miriam in the form of an apology good for her before the same company if refused she hereby challenges said miss kendall oh ho little monkey impertinent monkey said miriam to a competitive reading of virgil well breathed mary when she had finished as she sank apparently exhausted into a chair that is the most novel piece of literature i have ever read looking up from her low seat she laughed characteristically amused you should see yourselves standing around like conspirators and all for one little country girl who has taken a medieval form of demanding justice she's a fool said miriam spitefully stamping her foot oh perhaps but a fool could hardly get up a note like this it is on tiffany paper the writing not half bad not a word is misspelled and every small requirement is fulfilled i doubt if she is fourteen i am nearly seventeen and i could not write a better note it takes breeding too mary you are always generous spoke up a girl who had been the quietest of the group a girl of fifteen or sixteen small and very pretty not generous dorothy but i always have an irresistible impulse to take the other side the new girl is young alone and evidently clever there is something ingenuous about the letter she is unpleasant to me caroline said her rose and cream face showing that she had met an antipathetic nature i simply can't endure heroics dorothy and mary exchanged swift glances i can easily believe it caroline mary answered dryly little upstart coming here dressed like a guy and sending such a letter to one of us scornfully said jessie bentworth usually called jess did you ever see such hair asked helen dyke yes said caroline disgustedly and the way she tried to push herself in the very first meal well we'll just freeze paderewski out said dorothy languidly all nodded assent except mary who said she is countrified 
but i like her spunk and i shall take more interest in her than i usually do in new girls but it does seem doubtful about the four books of virgil yes that is decidedly fishy said jess making a wry face i certainly shall take some interest in her said dorothy in her soft bored voice i need amusement she's perfectly horrid said miriam frowning word of the challenge soon reached miss green the humor of the situation appealed strongly to her but she felt that it would be neither wise nor kind to pass it over without ascertaining the motive which prompted betty to act in this romantic manner whether it was pure romance or a sense of insulted dignity and the belief that this was the only way to assert her claim to justice miss green was the soul of fair play and her admiration for betty was increased since she had found her sensitive as well as courageous for it took courage to face a table full of hostile girls and bring the matter to a quick issue rather than wait to ingratiate herself little by little as an older and more worldly wise spirit would have done so she sent for betty who responded with alacrity for she felt that miss green was a friend miss green's room was enough like dr baird's study to put betty at her ease at once while the calm brown eyes gave her a feeling of home love and comfort a feeling she had not had since coming to the pines she looked intently at the books and miss green asked her if she liked to read yes miss green she answered though usually gifted with too great an abundance of words she felt strangely tongue-tied she might cry if she uttered another word for the reaction was coming on after the high-strung day i have a nice edition of stevenson's the child's garden of verses and miss green handed it to betty it is very pretty betty answered looking at the cover and turning the leaves i like the way she handles a book miss green reflected no moistening of her thumb or careless bending of the cover evidently though she is not much of a reader for she seems very indifferent i have not read it betty said as she returned the book what poetry do you like or don't you care for it many of the girls here do not not like poetry and betty's eyes shone i love flodden field the last minstrel the eve of st agnes hohenlinden percy and douglas and and oh lots of others and she stopped for breath oh they are the ones i love too exclaimed miss green and sennacherib and young lochinvar yes and the skeleton in armor they are all in an old reader of fathers i know them all by heart she exclaimed her face lit up with enthusiasm and this too at midnight in his guarded tent the turk was dreaming of the hour then miss green quoted her eyes dark with the spirit of the gay old strife fair stood the wind for france when we our sails advance and the two in concert triumphantly recited agincourt to the end just those names make me cold all over beaumont and willoughby bear them right dotily fairers and fanhope said betty shrugging her shoulders together with delight i know said miss green for i thrill every time i read there was a sound of revelry by night and belgium's capital had gathered then her beauty and her chivalry the old ballads are more shivery said betty they just hant me as our old cook katie says but ossian is my favorite ossian exclaimed miss green looking at the child in surprise he always seemed gloomy to me i don't know why i like him father says he is sentimental but it is all so gray and grieving and everything is solemn and large and grand i love old old things that don't happen nowadays old unhappy far-off things and battles long ago suggested miss green lifting her eyebrows inquiringly oh that just explains what i like about ossian and the ballads said betty clasping her hands delightedly 
we certainly have had an hour with the poets said miss green smilingly and i feel we must be friends having been introduced by the very best people by drayton and byron for instance but in my enthusiasm i must not forget to tell you why i sent for you she hesitated i know about the challenge betty reddened but spoke up vigorously wasn't that a mean contemptible thing for that kendall girl to say she demanded it was assented miss green but i am going to ask you to let it drop i shall talk with miriam and she will understand that you are doing it at my request i shall tell her a few plain facts i will do just whatever you ask because and the child blushed and hesitated for she didn't know how to say it because you have made me so happy i thought i should never be happy again miss green knew how brief childish troubles are but she also knew that they are bitter and she showed her sympathy by patting the little brown hand as she said things will soon brighten betty thought things were all rose-colored as she left miss green's room if troubles never come singly and they certainly had come in battalions to her lately she found that joys too come in troops end of chapter six recording by holly jensen chapter seven of betty baird by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter seven a roommate as betty went lightly into her room her face still bright from her good time with miss green she saw a pretty refined girl of her own age sitting in a dejected attitude looking out of the window her eyes opened wide with surprise then a radiant smile came to her face someone was calling how perfectly grand joyously she went up to the girl just as one of the teachers came in and said i have brought you a roommate miss elizabeth baird of weston miss lois bird of baltimore oh good i am too glad for anything cried the delighted girl and seized the stranger's hand i have been awfully lonely the new girl smiled shyly and pleasantly in reply and the teacher left them to become better acquainted has your trunk come inquired betty looking around it is behind the door betty felt comforted by the sound of the girl's sweet voice the days have been so long and so silent i shall rearrange my things so you can have half of the closet when i put up my duds i was not sure i should be so fortunate as to have a roommate luckily i don't need many hooks maybe you won't think you are fortunate when you know me better said lois oh anybody would be better than to be alone but you and betty shook her head appreciatively she was too pleased and excited to sit down and was walking aimlessly around when she noticed on the dressing-table a copy of little women which lois had carried to read on the cars little women oh i love it she exclaimed lois's eyes grew bright so do i i read and reread it she answered i am so glad you brought yours said betty i had lent mine to a girl at home and i couldn't bear to take it from her before she had finished it for it is simply awful not to know whether it turns out happy or not have you ever read four years at lakeside oh yes isn't it lovely perfectly lovely answered betty and wasn't it awful the way lily bent was treated at first by the other girls well since coming here i can sympathize with her you wouldn't believe girls could be so mean as they have been to me oh tell me exclaimed lois rapturously and admiringly betty too sat down by the long low casement window and with much energy and telling gesticulation told her about miriam and the challenge it would be impossible to find a more interested listener and the number of the how means showed an intellectual and moral sympathy not wasted on betty who when she had finished said i'll ask miss green to allow you to sit at our table for there is room but you might find some nice girls at one of the others though they all look alike to me 
i want to sit with you said lois decidedly besides if we are together we won't feel snubbed i certainly want you for a gay companion is a wagon to him that is wearied by the way these girls have wearied me to lois's look of surprise and question she said don't be surprised for i am always quoting even father couldn't break me of it i saw that in a book last week and i have thought of it ever since but i am not gay replied lois oh i don't like gay people really don't you remember that lily bent was grave and sweet last night i saw a falling star and oh i wished for a roommate and it has come true she said clapping her hands i never got a wish in time for a falling star replied lois but i am always saying the same thing with someone else i say shakespeare said betty i say milton said lois but i think i'll unpack now so i'll have it off my mind she continued i'll help together we can unpack in a jiffy said betty as she flew at the strap which after much tugging they unfastened oh what lovely dresses she exclaimed as they brought out dress after dress of exquisite pattern i am sure there is not another girl in the school with so many beautiful things i am glad you like them but i think i have too many added lois seeing betty's scantily furnished hooks she had conceived for betty one of those sudden friendships not uncommon in girls of her age but this was for her the first and enduring one betty felt the greatest enthusiasm in return and thought she had the loveliest roommate in the school it is just as well to have plenty here replied betty don't you know i never thought at all about clothes but since coming here and hearing the girls talk about my dresses and i was so glad over them too and even disliking me because my things are not stylish that is the only word they seem to know i have thought more about my clothes than in all the years of my life it makes more difference to those girls whether your dress is an inch too long than whether you know your lessons perfectly horrid said lois i never have been envious said betty but i believe i am a weenty teenty so of those beautiful dresses nearly a whole closet full and not one made over i have always wanted a made over dress said lois is that so i'll lend you one of mine for we are about the same size oh thank you i'd be so pleased you'll soon see what they are half a yard too narrow inches too short with ruffles to piece it out braid to hide the seams they have to be so sponged and pressed that they never have that delicious new smell and feel oh what a face exclaimed lois as betty finished with a grimace lois had never met anyone so interesting your mouth looked actually a yard long she finished with a laugh only a yard are you sure it wasn't two only one lois insisted i am sure it was two well anyway it is an open question and the two girls laughed delightedly over the pun if it is that long i suppose i shall have to keep saying prunes and prisms for a while having finished their unpacking they dressed for dinner and while waiting for the bell lois saw betty's picture of her mother how beautiful it must be to have a mother mine died before i knew her she said betty stood aghast never knew her mother she had never before met such a poor bereaved girl she stood staring at her for a moment then took up the picture the picture of the one who never seemed far away so pervading was her love she was grieved and dazed for an instant then quickly gave the picture to lois and said let her be your mother too she has a heart like like and her gesture indicated the universe most mothers have so many little girls and mine only has me and she could love so many lois took the picture and kissed it tenderly i must never make you regret your kindness she said and turned away to hide her tears while betty grew so energetic that she nearly tore down the wardrobe in her pretense of arranging things 
the dinner bell sounded as betty was indulging her favorite pastime of tying hair ribbons expertly by making the black bow on lois's dark hair a little nattier now there that's just right she said giving it a finishing pat as they walked downstairs arm in arm lois whispered point out the horrid girl who said that about you what is her name miriam kendall replied betty also in a whisper but we'll call her orpheus because don't you know he is the god with the lyre and by twisting it enough we can make it liar splendid exclaimed lois we can talk all we please about orpheus and no one will know what we are talking about so when i say at the table there is orpheus you will know i mean that girl explained betty as they took their places together at the table for lois had been given caroline's place every eye was fastened on betty who nevertheless felt perfectly at ease for now she had a good friend and supporter sustained by lois's sweet and understanding sympathy she had no self-consciousness and took her place at the table with a grace peculiarly her own she did things not as one who watched to see how others did them but as a born leader and her self-confidence was the outgrowth not of ignorance but of habit miss green introduced lois to the different members of the table she's my kind whispered caroline to miriam we must see that she doesn't become intimate with that hateful thing snapped miriam the duelist giggled caroline good applauded miriam caroline turned her cold glance towards betty and scrutinized her as one would an inanimate object while miriam tossed her head contemptuously end of chapter seven Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Eight of Betty Baird by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Eight The Duel After All. Betty, you have only an hour to prepare for your Latin class do stop fiddling with those books and get at your lesson pleaded lois oh don't bother me lois i am putting these books of poetry together well it seems very foolish of you to be so indifferent when you know how much depends on this first class i heard the girls say last evening that miriam was going around getting all the best latin scholars in the school to help her prepare her lesson jessie bentworth said you will look pretty foolish when you get up thinking you can read virgil and miriam said let's all snicker when she sits down let them snicker their snickering won't hurt anybody said betty lightly i am going to dress now for appearances count more than anything else here she added rather bitterly hey ho well since you say i must change my dress i'll do so though i think this black silk is good enough for anybody no you must put on that white piquet suit and i am going to fix your hair but just read your lesson over once that's a dear said lois coaxingly oh lois you bother me to death i don't want to be smart i want to be pretty replied betty teasingly i can't understand why you are so obstinate about it i am just trembling like a leaf said lois ho why dost thou shiver and shake gaffer gray and why dost thy nose look so blue sang betty provokingly now come arrange my hair that's a good girl and don't worry about the latin part of it you'll see yes i'll see you fizzle well if you do i'll die of mortification i almost quarrelled with jessie bentworth last evening over it all they are just dying to have you fail indeed this certainly seems to be a very grave occasion judging by the condition you are all in and betty laughed nevertheless in spite of her indifferent manner she awaited the hour with impatience she had challenged miriam to a reading before the girls of their own table only but as that had been prevented by miss green the result was that the first virgil class would be practically a duel between the two before the whole school which as betty recognized would vindicate her all the more completely 
there was an air of expectation throughout the school for word of the challenge had spread among the pupils and they were all agog to see the impertinent new girl put down even miss payne ignorant of the cause felt the suppressed excitement when she came into the main schoolroom where on a slight elevation the latin class recited if it had been in one of the smaller classrooms the contest would have been witnessed by few now however every girl in the school would see betty's discomfiture for it was generally believed that she had boasted unwarrantably at the table and that her meagre acquirements would soon be evident to all even those who were unfriendly to miriam stood by her and wished her luck in her recitation lois whose seat was near the rostrum where she could hear every word was white with excitement at first betty was not anxious for her cousin did not seem half as terrifying as her strict father but when the recitation had actually begun she had something akin to stage fright she herself became like poor gaffer gray though it was not apparent to the onlookers except by her extreme paleness mary livingstone was the only girl acquainted with the whole story who was neutral what betty had said seemed to be pure boasting yet the evident truth and reliability of the new girl puzzled her and she decided to withhold judgment until after the recitation she was eagerly alive to the excitement of the contest and pushed her books aside to listen more at ease even the usually indifferent dorothy king could not keep fascinated eyes from the virgil class and she and mary whispered and looked and whispered again some of the pupils in the rear of the room took seats farther front in order to hear better and others actually stood up when the recitations began a strange tense breathless silence filled the room several girls had recited more or less indifferently and the feeling of impatience was growing more intense when miss payne called on miriam to recite now said betty to herself we'll see what that girl knows about it and she watched her eagerly the eyes of the listeners shifted from miriam to betty and back to miriam watching to see how betty was taking miriam's reading with her closed book on her lap her forefinger keeping the place betty sat like a marble statue though her heart sounded to her like a bass drum i don't believe she can read it at all for she isn't even looking into her book whispered caroline to jessie who was mockingly watching betty nothing but sheer stupidity could make a girl act so they thought as was miriam's custom she stumbled and stuttered through the lines though on this day she did better than usual because of the help she had received she knew the whole school would be watching the contest and at the end she sat down with something of a flourish for she had outdone herself miss payne suggested some changes in her translation adding you did unusually well today, miriam that is a good beginning for the new school year little suspecting how much she contributed to the dramatic action of the moment miss payne next called on betty who sprang up tossing her hair back from her forehead and prepared to read at the sound of her clear sweet voice necks were craned eagerly and every eye was fastened on her she stood there a slight graceful girl in a simple white piqué dress her face almost as white as the dress in contrast with which the dark beautiful eyes appeared the more remarkable her thick flaxen hair was parted in the middle and hung in the round head style worn by much younger girls an arrangement that gave a sweetness and a distinction to her face that was not lost on the pupils and made miss payne start with surprise in her belt was a large red rose stuck there at the last moment by lois and unnoticed by betty until she was in the class as she read the blood came back to her cheeks and her interested expression showed that in the lines she loved she had forgotten the hostile critical faces around her she read through the long lesson without a single correction from her teacher her voice clear and melodious as if rendering sweet and familiar music when she had finished miss payne exclaimed enthusiastically excellent that is one of the best translations i have ever heard it shows your father's thorough training 
dr baird is one of the great latin scholars of our country she explained to the girls and i believe that his daughter's example will be an inspiration to you all thank you miss payne said betty and turning slightly she added i have read four books of virgil and she looked deliberately and haughtily at miriam great was the excitement in the schoolroom when she sat down and such was the buzz of conversation that miss payne was compelled to ring her bell sharply for order jessie bentworth leaned over to miriam and asked wickedly shall we snicker miriam miriam only scowled in reply when betty went to her room after school lois jumped up from her chair to meet her threw her arms around her and hugged her ecstatically oh it was glorious glorious i am so proud i don't know what to do ho where's gaffer gray now asked betty oh do sit down now betty and don't walk around like a caged lion while i tell you everything begged lois unable herself to keep still for a second every girl in that room listened you should have seen them mary livingstone clapped softly when you finished and said i see she knew what she was talking about and she and miss king nodded and laughed when orpheus made such a fizzle and i heard dorothy say you were mighty pretty oh no she didn't mean me exclaimed betty deprecatingly yes she did and mary nodded and said she makes some of the girls look like paper dolls oh you were so splendid you look tall tall did i really she exclaimed highly flattered well anyhow i'm glad it's over i wonder how miriam feels now asked lois triumphantly oh i guess she feels like that young lady of niger who smiled as she rode on a tiger they came back from the ride with the lady inside and the smile on the face of the tiger the girls were laughing merrily together when mary livingstone came in to speak of the latin episode and warmly congratulate betty on her triumph facetiously patting her on the head after the custom of the reverend seniors she said good child good work and the two new girls felt truly initiated end of chapter eight recording by holly jensen